Now here we are, your right upper quadrant. The area of your body that you have no idea what the names mean, there's some kind of crazy Latin, drives you crazy, cola this, cola that, cola doca, where am I going, I don't know. Well we're gonna break it down for you and I'm gonna tell you the story of the stone. A story of the little gallbladder that could. Now your gallbladder doesn't know any better. So imagine you have your prototypic patient. What are the risk factors? Well, the risk factors are fat, fertile, 40, and female. Fat, fertile, 40, and female. We've heard that since the beginning of time. We walked into med school and it was like, ugh, physiology, fat, 40, female. But all of those four components mean the same thing. Fat, high estrogen. Fertile, high estrogen. Fertile, high estrogen. Female, obviously high estrogen. Estrogen is the most potent smooth muscle relaxant. That's why women get more DVTs. That's why women who are prepubescent and adolescent have a normal finding of mitral valve prolapse. That's why they get gallstones. That's why they get more kidney stones. That's why they have all of these things that confer smooth muscle relaxation. In the setting of gallstones, however, a fat fertile 40 female presents to the office and she gets an abdominal ultrasound for unrelated reasons. And the abdominal ultrasound shows a little gallstone just right sitting right there, a cute little gallstone, just not mind, do, do, doing nothing at all. Just doing nothing at all. It's binding, you know, its own business. If that patient did not get an ultrasound and did not know the gallstone was there, she'd have no clue. But if a patient has asymptomatic gallstones, that's called cholelithiasis. Cholelithiasis. This simply means gallstones in the gallbladder, they're doing nothing. And since they're doing nothing, my friends in cyber world, what are you going to do about them? Nothing. That's right. They're asymptomatic, you leave it alone. Now let's say your gallbladder says, I made this for you, it's a little stone, I made it for you. And over time, you make more and more gallstones. Now this fat, fertile, 40 female, one day decides, I'm going to have a pizza, and some chicken, and a cheesecake. Are you hungry? I am. And what's going to happen is, is their gallbladder is going to start contracting. Why? Well, because fatty foods cause you to release who? Cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin. Think about the name. Cola. Gall system. Cysta. The big cyst that's there filled with bile. Kinin. Move, man, move. So this hormone tells your gallbladder, contract. And so your gallbladder contracts in response to this massive fat intake. And in the beginning, that gallstone didn't cause any problems, but it got bigger over time as it was bathed in bile. Bathed in bile. And now that gallstone begins to ball valve in and out, in and out of the cystic duct right here. And every time this patient eats fatty food, she notices the sharp right upper quadrant pain and it won't go away for 30 to 45 minutes. Condition number one, as I told you, was Cholothiasis, condition number two, is now known as symptomatic biliary colic. In other words, if you take cholelithiasis plus pain, that equals biliary colic. But all it is is still a gallstone. It's not occluding anything. It's just ball valving <coughs> into the cystic duct. When that happens, if they're symptomatic gallstones, all you do is you diagnose them with an ultrasound. Treatment is surgery. Remove the gallbladder. Now let's say, for example, your patient ignored your advice and said, I don't want to remove my gallbladder. It was just trying to make me something. And now she had another fatty meal. But instead of saying that, you know what, the pain instead of going away after 30 to 45 minutes, it's constant and it's getting worse and now I have a fever and a white count. That means, you see the CD right here? That's your cystic duct. The stone is now sitting right inside your cystic duct. And it's closed off access to your gallbladder and it can't get anything out. Now you've got a problem. Now you have a fever, an increased white count, and right upper quadrant pain. This, my friends, is the condition all of you think everyone has. It's cholecystitis. On physical exam, you palpate the right upper quadrant and it causes a cessation of inspiration, known as a positive Murphy sign. The best initial test for these people is an ultrasound. You need to know the three ultrasound findings, and I'm going to tell you what they are right now. The first 
is pericholecystic fluid. The second is increased gallbladder wall thickness. And why is the gallbladder wall thickening up? Any time there's inflammation anywhere in the body, swelling is the first sign of inflammation. And the third finding is what? Gallstones. But they're going to say something different than gallstones. They're never going to say to you, gallstones are seen on your exam. Do you know what caused it? It's going to be acoustic shadowing. Now what the hell is acoustic shadowing? Acoustic shadowing. Sound, visual, acoustic, shadowing. Doesn't really make sense. Well, I'm going to explain it to you right now. Your ultrasound probe is here. Your gallbladder is in the between. Sound waves go through. If there's a gallstone here, the sound waves will hit it, but instead of transmitting all the way down, you will then see a break in the sound waves. And this is the shadow that a gallstone makes. That's known as acoustic shadowing. You see those three findings on ultrasound, your patient has col uh, cholecystitis. Best initial therapy, best initial therapy, antibiotics. If they improve, you continue antibiotics for several weeks, and then you bring them back for definitive therapy, which is surgery. However, if you start antibiotics in the setting of cholecystitis and the patient does not get better, the patient does not get better after a day or two, they're still having fevers, white cats not improving, pain is getting worse, emergent laparoscopic removal of the gallbladder. That's if the stone is stuck at the cystic duct. Now what happens if this stone, instead of getting wedged in the cystic duct, made its way out? Ah! I'm free! Can't catch me now. And it goes into this little area here at the confluence. This is known as your confluence between your hepatic duct, your right and left system, and your new duct known as your CBD. And the stone sits here. Now what you have to know is your CBD tapers down smoothly. That's right, like a pair of nice jeans. It tapers down smoothly, and that gallstone is going to sort of work its way down. And it's going to make its way down, and it's going to constantly get bathed with bile, so it's also going to increase in size. And eventually, it might get stuck. But before it gets stuck, it's actually condition number four. If you have a stone that's sitting in your common bile duct, non-obstructing, it is known as cholidocolithiasis. Now, that's a hard one to remember. Cholidocolithiasis. The way I used to remember this when I was in med school was cola don't go nowhere lithiasis because that stone has nowhere to go. Cola don't go nowhere lithiasis. How do you diagnose it? You're going to get an ultrasound. And what you're going to notice is there's going to be a dilated common bile duct. How do you treat it? Well, it's pretty straightforward. ERCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. It is an endoscopic procedure, and here's what happens. The endoscope comes down through the mouth, throws basically a cut into your ampulla. Now, what is this ampulla here called? It is known as your ampulla of Vader. That's right, your ampulla of Vader. It is an ampulla that finds your lack of faith disturbing. Now what it does is it cuts this open, throws a wire up, grabs a stone, and pulls it back down. Pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward, right? And it takes the stone out. Cola, don't go nowhere, Lathias has just found a place to go. That's condition number four in the story of the stone. But your stone didn't get pulled out by ERCP because this patient still ignored it. I don't care. I don't care if it's there. Well, the next condition is this stone started making its way down. And let's say it stayed right here and got wedged in. The stone got wedged in. That's condition number five. Condition number five is, again, cholidocolithiasis. But when it occludes the common bile duct, you now have what's known as cholangitis. Now, what makes it cholangitis? It's not just the occlusion of the duct that makes it cholangitis. What makes it cholangitis is the fact that you have fever, white count, pain, hypotension, and altered mental status, also known as shock. Now you're wondering, well, what the hell just happened? How do we go from a cute little stone to something that almost kills the person? Well, what that stone just did, 
is it took every duct in your liver and took the only exit point and closed it off. And it just turned your entire hepatobiliary system into one giant pus pocket. Your liver is now a pimple that will kill you. And so this stone sitting right there needs to come out. So how do you diagnose these people? Well, let me tell you. We're talking ultrasound again. But remember, in the case of cholecystitis, if the ultrasound does not help you, you're going to get a HIDA scan. A HIDA scan is the definitive test for cholecystitis. In the case of cholangitis, if the ultrasound does not tell you definitively there is a wedge stone, a dilated common bile duct, plus your intra and extra hepatic ducts are also dilated, if that's not definitive by your ultrasound, you're going to get what's known as an MRCP, a magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography. So you're going to send this patient for an ultrasound. Best test is an MRCP. Now a lot of you are saying, well, we think the stone is there. Why not go up with an ERCP and just take it out? ERCPs are therapeutic, not diagnostic. The MR is diagnostic because you can have other reasons for a stone and an ERCP carries a side effect of bleeding because you cut the ampulla as well as pancreatitis because of the dye affecting the pancreas. So now you've got this e MRCP done if you need it. But before you even can send the patient for imaging, what do you need to do? Well, since their fever, white count, all that's going on, antibiotics and fluids, they need to be stabilized. Now here's a permutation of this question. If the patient is too sick to get the ultrasound, to get the MRCP, but you think this is biliary sepsis, which is also cholangitis, you're gonna do something known as a percutaneous transhepatic cholangiotoscopy. In other words, PTC, which means you're gonna take a needle coming in from the skin and you're gonna open up the bile duct with a tube and drain the bile and drain the pus from above the stone. This is a temporary measure. All it is is because you don't have time to get an ERCP done or the patient's too sick for it, you're gonna go through the skin, pierce the gallbladder, excuse me, pierce the common bile duct and allow drainage of bile and pus while antibiotics are on board. It's an emergency maneuver, but it does work. The patient will still eventually need to have that gallstone removed. That's condition number six. Remember, fever, white count, pain, cholecystitis. Fever, white count, pain, hypotension, altered mental status, dilated intra-extra hepatics, dilated CBD, cholangitis. Now your sixth condition is a special one. Let's say the stone did not get better. Let's say the stone did not get stuck. Let's say the stone made its way down to the ampulla where the common bile duct meets your pancreatic duct. Oh, is that how gallstones cause pancreatitis? Yes! That is exactly how gallstones cause pancreatitis. The stone got stuck right there, right over here. That's the second time this gallstone tried to kill you. Right? Pancreatitis patients are going to present with severe, severe epigastric pain that radiates into their back. They're going to say that they've had a history of, let's say, biliary colic. What that's telling you on the exam is that this patient's ignored this symptom. The stone made its way out, made its way down, cholecystitis. Skip the cholangitis part, pancreatitis. They're going to have abnormal liver function tests. They're going to have a variety of findings. Remember, in cholangitis, these patients can also be what? Jaundiced. That's right. Jaundice can occur here, but not in cholecystitis. In pancreatitis, you'll have abnormal liver function tests, but again, you may or may not have actual jaundice because the bile may be draining, it may not be. It depends on where the stone actually is. Best initial test for a patient with pancreatitis, amylase and lipase. The most sensitive is amylase. The most specific is lipase. The only thing that can cause your amylase to be depressed, meaning falsely low, is that the pancreatitis is from hypertriglyceridemia. Otherwise, they both will be elevated. There's no need to trend them. If the patient has an elevated amylase lipase in the setting of a gallstone, you're going to hydrate them, and then you're eventually going to take that stone out once they've cooled down a bit. You're going to get rid of that stone through an ERCP, and then eventually they'll get an elective cholecystectomy. Now, what if the patient's not getting better with the pancreatitis? Well, what are you going to do? Well, we talked about it before. If after 48 hours they're not improving, you're going to go ahead and get a CAT scan to see just how bad the inflammation is. Remember, you can have findings like a pseudocyst that develops after pancreatitis. You can have pancreatic abscesses, hemorrhagic pancreatitis. You can also have infected necrotic pancreatitis. This is all subsets after the initial insult 
or might have alcohol or gallstone. It could be a scorpion. But the point here is in this case, in the story of the stone, the culprit is that gallstone right there. The last condition that you need to know about gallstones, which is incredibly rare, is known as gallstone ileus. Now in gallstone ileus, the stone actually makes its way out and rolls down a small intestine and causes an ileus to develop. The patient develops symptoms of nausea, vomiting. Best initial test is going to be an x-ray showing small bowel loops that are dilated. However, a CAT scan will show that contrast gets through. It's not that there's an obstructive point. It's just the fact that the bowels have become sluggish. Ladies and gentlemen, that is your story of the stone. It starts out by an asymptomatic gallstone sitting in your gallbladder known as cholelithiasis that later becomes symptomatic causing biliary colic. That stone can get wedged and cause acute cholecystitis, fever, white count, right up a quadrant pain, get an ultrasound, take out the gallbladder after you give antibiotics. If the patient then gets that stone to move its way out, now it's asymptomatic sitting in the common bowel duct. That's called cholelithiasis. If in the case of cholelithiasis, the stone makes its way down further to common bowel duct, now they have something where it's occluding the common bowel duct, the exit point for the entire liver, now you have cholangitis, now they're going to have fever, white count, jaundice, pain, and altered mental status, hypotension, antibiotics, if you need more testing, go for an MRCP, get the stone out, MRCP, ERCP, and then give them a long-term solution, which is an elective cholecystectomy. If the stone makes its way further down, boom, pancreatitis, story of the stone.